Chicago weakness in understanding of science is haunting our society. Science is the is seen as the driver be, behind innovation and international competitiveness. I particularly appreciate what Alan and this group are trying to do with the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. To be a, 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 a good scientist is to be critical. You, know, you can get burned, and I'll tell a story. Can I tell a story? This is a shut story. It's a terrible story, and it's not even supposed to be out, I don't think, but I'm going to tell it anyways. Time itself doesn't exist. There is no time. There is no change. We're going to develop batteries that will have as good a gas mileage as, as gasoline um, when there is not even a laboratory-scale prototype that has this, anything like the energy density of gasoline. You're in the exact same mess. And you have to be very careful not to get into technological wishful thinking. The rest of the world is going to want more efficient, cleaner energy technologies. If we can develop those, manufacture them, it can be an economic opportunity. I'm, I'm a big believer in space exploration, uh, but also in the human spirit. The breakthroughs in nanoscience, the ability to create and prepare nanoscaled matter is really putting us in a position to understand how biology works. I encourage you to think about becoming a member and uh, helping us spread uh, good information uh, around Chicago and the surrounding areas about science, technology, engineering. The Tritos are my best friend. Oh, really? Well, um, hi, I'm Erin Dragato, Executive Director of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. And if some of you didn't catch that last bit there from Le Dr. Leon Letterman, he said neutrinos are my best friend, <laughs> um, uh, which he spoke at one of our Ask a Scientist event. And um, um, some of you may know his work on the Higgs boson, what his work on Higgs boson has done for current physics research uh, in today. And we were proud to host Leon along with the many other researchers, scientists, CEOs, and um, policymakers, some of which you've just seen. Um, and also will hear speak today. Um, C2SD serves as a community leader to educate, engage, and advocate to increase the public understanding of science, technology, and engineering in our society. <clears throat> and some of you may or may not know that in the 300 mile radius of the Chicagoland area, more federally funded research occurs here than the coast combined. And it is imperative that we convey, um, we, collective, uh, the richness of these resources and groundbreaking um, uh, research occurring in our backyard. Um, so we are, we are really, uh, hopefully, <laughs> the, going to be the vanguard to do that. Over the last six years, C2ST has um, done its part by hosting these events. And um, I can proudly say that Today marks um, the 70th program that we have ever done, and it coincides very nicely with the 70th anniversary of the nuclear chain reaction. So um, we did it on purpose. No, <laughs> I, can't, I wish I could say that we could. Um, I encourage you to become a member and get to know our organization. Members uh, receive discounts to our programs. Um, you have the opportunity to network, as you, as you did here today. Um, and we have many other events that you, you can be a part of. We do a biannual Women in Science Symposium, which is growing in momentum. Um, and, uh, you know, access to some of those talks and the videos that you saw clips of earlier. Um, if you're really gung-ho as a member, we really encourage you to help um, shape the programs, too, as we, as we gain more momentum. Um, so we encourage members to do that. And staff can, um, I want to point out Kathy Shapiro here in the audience, and you can um, talk to her afterwards, uh, or any of our staff if you'd like to be more, you know, if you're interested in membership or be more involved. Um, or go to our website, c2st.org. Um, but without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome you all here today on this cold day uh, to CP1, Past, Present, and Future of Nuclear Energy. 
We are ever so grateful to have our partners here as well, Argonne National Laboratory, um, Eleanor Taylor, and, and some of her, her uh, stupendous staff for promoting and sponsoring, as well as her video crew and team. Um, and I'm actually really delighted to introduce these speakers today because um, Alan, Dr. Alan Treesheim was uh, Director Emeritus of Argonne National Laboratory, co-founder of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, and um, a AKA our fearless leader, as we like to call him. Um, Dr. Shisham served as Argonne from 83 to 1996, and he joined Argonne after a long career with Exxon Corporation. He was the first national laboratory director to be recruited from industry. Shisham, um, Dr. Shisham is the fellow American Association for the Advancement of Science and a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a past chairman of the National Conference of Advancement of Research. So thank you, Alan, for taking the time today and your busy schedule <laughs> to be a part of our talk. Dr. Mark Peters is the Deputy Lab Director for Programs at Argonne National Laboratory and responsible for management and integration of laboratory science and technology portfolio, strategic planning, laboratory-directed research and development program, and technology transfer. Dr. Peters also serves as the Senior Advisor to the Department of Energy on nuclear energy technologies and research and development programs in nuclear waste policy. Welcome, Dr. Peters. And finally, Dr. Robert Rosner. Uh, he's a William Rather Distinguished Service Professor in Astronomy and Astrophysics and Physics Director, Energy Policy Institute of Chicago at the University of Chicago, um, as well as Enrico Fermi Institute and Harris School of Public Policies, doing special projects over there. He served as Argonne National Laboratory's Chief Scientist and Associate Laboratory Director for Physical, Biological, and Computational Sciences, and was Argonne's Lab Director um, from 2009 to 2005. And he was founding and co-chair of the U.S. Department of Energy's National Laboratory Directors Council um, from 2007 to 2009. And I um, also wanted to thank Dr. Rosner. He was our first speaker, very first speaker for a C2ST program talking about um, the future of energy. And um, Dr. Shreesheim, uh, this is the first time our fearless leader has ever spoken in a program for us. So there's a lot of firsts today, a lot of anniversaries today. <laughs> um, so I'd like to welcome all three of them to the stage. And um, Dr. Shreesheim will begin our presentation. Thank you for coming. Well, thanks, uh, Aaron, for that kind introduction. <clears throat> it is a uh, pleasure to speak at the 70th anniversary of C2ST, as well as the 70th anniversary of the nuclear chain reaction. Now, uh, my role in this is to give a little bit of background on the uh, origins of CP1 and CP2. CP stands for Chicago Pile, Chicago Pile 1 and Chicago Pile 2. And the narrative arc uh, is the development of the atomic bomb in the Second World War. It was not the development of nuclear energy for electrical generation purposes. It was for the development of the bomb. And uh, that really is the, the narrative, the narrative arc at the origin of the CP1 and CP2 at the University of Chicago and at Argonne. Now, I will just briefly trace the history I recommend for those of you who are really interested, an excellent book by Richard Rhodes on the making of the atomic bomb. He also wrote a book on the making of the hydrogen bomb, but the book on the making of the atomic bomb is the best book that I know of 
that delves into the, the history, the development, the people. It is a, uh, a really good contribution. And Richard, uh, when I was lab director, Richard came out to the lab. I invited him and also invited all of the then living participants in the CP1 to, uh, to come and listen to him talk. It was very moving. Now, the, um, the history, which I will sketch very briefly, as I said, um, more detail would go back, of course, to the cures and uh, discovery of radiation. But um, it really is uh, dependent, the development is dependent on a few, at the beginning, on a few European scientists who had come to the United States as a result of the racial laws either in Germany or in Italy. The, um, the, the Fermi, for example, uh, who was key, uh, came here from Italy, his wife was Jewish, and the Mussolini had uh, the racial laws that were problems, so he emigrated, came to Columbia University, Leo Zillard also uh, left uh, Hungary. His parents were Jewish. So that's sort of an interesting sideline to the, to the uh, way in which uh, our, our um, enemies in uh, Europe turn out to be our friends because all these people migrated. Um, in 1938, uh, Hahn, Strassmann, and Meitner, Otto Hahn, Felix Strassmann, Lisa Meitner in Europe, uh, discovered that, um, uh, really discovered nuclear fission. They, um, uh, they produced barium from uranium by bombarding it with neutrons, and the interpretation at the time was that this was the first demonstration of nuclear fission. Um, Niels Bohr came to the United States and uh, brought this information to the attention of Zillard and uh, Wigner and Fermi, among others. And it didn't take long for Szilard and Fermi, Wigner, to decide that the Germans were embarked on a, or could embark on a program to develop nuclear fission for atomic weapons. So they, wrote this famous letter uh, for I, uh, Einstein's signature, Albert Einstein's signature, I think Einstein is a large signature, and uh, that was what precipitated the origins of the, what turned out to be the Manhattan Project. Named the Manhattan Project because uh, the engineering core of the Army, the project was given to the Army because it was felt that they were used to constructing big projects. So it was originally headquartered in Manhattan, and the Army Engineering Corps had the habit at the time, I don't know if it's still true today, of naming their projects, big projects, where the headquarters was. So this was called the Manhattan Project or Manhattan District Project. I'm skipping over a lot of detail that you can get from the Richard Rhodes book, but the arc of the narrative is, is of course, accurate. Um, Fermi and Zillard cooperated on a original design of a nuclear reactor, which was a graphite-moderated reactor. For those of you 
who are unfamiliar with, with uh, nuclear chain reactions, the, uh, the, 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 the issue, one of the issues, is to slow the neutrons down so that they can react with the uranium and cause the uranium to fission. Neutron hits uranium, uranium fission, splits and uh, generates uh, three neutrons, I think, and uh, loses some mass. The mass is converted into energy via Einstein's famous E equals mc squared equation. So Zillard and Fermi had this original design for a nuclear reactor, which was a graphite moderated nuclear reactor. And uh, the uranium committee, let's call it uranium committee, then decided that they needed to actually build, one of the things they needed to do was build a reactor. And they had a number of potential reactor designs and a number of potential separation processes to produce uranium, which we won't go into. And uh, they also, at that time, uh, Glenn Seaborg had uh, discovered by irradiation of uranium uh, in, a, in, a, in a cyclotron, I guess, out there on the West Coast, uh, small, very small amounts, minuscule amounts of plutonium. Plutonium is not a naturally occurring element. And uh, the committee, this, this uh, uranium committee, then launched really two projects. One to produce um, uh, uranium and the other, from uranium oxide, the other produced plutonium. They, uh, this original, so where to, where to set up this original pile? By that time, uh, Fermi had migrated to the University of Chicago. They had set up a uh, project at the University of Chicago and the uh, uranium committee decided that they should um, build this pile at the University of Chicago and the federal government got about a thousand acres of land out there in the forest preserve uh, <clears throat> um, uh, to construct the reactor, but th there was some labor dispute, I don't know quite what it was, so they went ahead and built this reactor underneath Stag Field and that is that famous, let me see if I can operate this thing, Ben, what? <laughs> I'm sure to. So what am I doing here, Ben? <laughs> oh, I got it. I think. Ah, okay. So there was, um, let me do this one. No one had a digital camera at the time, so there's no picture taken of this first pile, which was a assemblage of, let me see, let me get this one back, assemblage of uranium oxide uh, in pits uh, surrounded by, well, alternate layers of graphite, uranium oxide, graphite, uranium oxide. And uh, that is the, later on someone took this, uh, made this picture uh, drawing. And on the bottom you see the uh, Zillard, Compton, Fermi, and Wigner. Um, the original intent was to build a reactor to produce plutonium, but didn't take long to realize that they're not going to build any reactors to produce plutonium here in Chicago, and that was a major undertaking. Those reactors were built at Hanford. So CP1 um, demonstrated the potential, went critical, and uh, 
And it was then shut down and moved to out to the woods, so to speak. And um, interesting, the pile had a power level of about a half a watt. It was rebuilt at, uh, out there in the burbs, and I think at a power level of, uh, yeah, 10 kilowatts. Uh, that was um, operated for to the end of the war, I guess. And uh, there was also a CP3, which was a heavy water reactor, and that had an operating power of 300 kilowatts. All those three reactors were decommissioned by 1946 and buried. And uh, there's a 40-foot uh, burial chamber with a concrete casing on top and a plaque. So if you go out to Redgate Woods, it's called Side A Plot M, and uh, you can stand on top of those reactors. The, uh, the, 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 um, as I say, I'm not going to get into the detailed discussion of uh, all of the ramifications of the bomb project in the Second World War. I think I will only read to you uh, a farewell speech by General Groves. Leslie Groves was the military man who was in charge of supervising the Manhattan Project. And when the Manhattan Project was shifted from the military to civilian use, the old Atomic Energy Commission, uh, he gave a speech, just very short. Five years ago, the idea of atomic power is only a dream. You have made that dream a reality. You have seized upon the most nebulous of ideas, translated them into actualities, built cities where none were known before. You know, these are massive construction, Oak Ridge, Hanford, constructed industrial plants of a magnitude and to a precision, precision heretofore deemed impossible. You have built a weapon which ended the war, saved countless American lives. With regard to peacetime applications, you have raised the curtain on vistas of a new world and Mark Peters and Bob Rosner will talk about this new world. So thank you much. As I say, I recommend Rhodes' book if you really want to know the details. Aaron, this didn't want to launch, this didn't want to launch in uh, slideshow. Is that was that the problem? Just click through. Okay. So good afternoon. It's a it's a great pleasure to be here at this event. It's an incredible honor to be on the podium with these with these two gentlemen. I should say I'm uh, I'm slightly nervous. Uh, speaking with two lab directors because I didn't clear my slides with you guys before before I before I got up here. Um, so my job is to take uh, paint sort of the current landscape, but just to fill in quickly the where argon fits. So after those three critical piles, uh, there was a few additional critical piles. Uh, we they moved a little bit from Palos, a little bit north up towards uh, Lamont into the Argon Woods, and that was the genesis of Argon National Laboratory. So Argon was born out of the Manhattan Project. They were the lab that was put, put in place to develop peaceful uses of nuclear technology. So we're proud that actually our first scientific director was Enrico Fermi. So he came to, came to the lab and continued his work thinking about, uh, in particular, breeder reactors, among other things, when he was at the lab. Um, so through the 50s, through, through the 50s and 60s, and into the 70s, 
our, our very talented nuclear engineering staff worked extensively on designing what now you're seeing out there operating, generating electricity in the United States and worldwide. Uh, so we developed early designs, worked with industry like GE, like Westinghouse, and again, can trace it back, sort of the family tree of nuclear goes back to CP1, but it goes, argon's prominent all through that tree. So uh, given that we're a lab and we're argon, we're always thinking about what's next, thinking about advanced technologies. But again, my job today is to talk about current, Bob will talk about uh, future. I can't resist completely not talking about the future, but I'll focus mostly on the present. I think I should be able to flip this right. Yeah, so uh, I want to spend some time walking through, just giving all of you all a picture of the nuclear energy landscape, commercial nuclear energy landscape. And, and I couched it in the title as challenges and opportunities because I think it's actually, I, I suppose you can stand up here and say this about anything at any, any given moment, but I do think it's an interesting time for nuclear energy as a contributor to our energy system. And, and I'll get into that in some details we go through. There's, there's some things that are playing on the, on, on the scale of the energy system uh, just, for example, natural gas. Uh, you've heard about that. Uh, that. That's having a dramatic impact. Uh, but I think it's important to start with, this is just simply percentage of electricity generation by country. This is 2009 data, so there may be a percent or two off, but this is... So you can see the United States there sitting at around 20%. So about 20% of our electricity is gener generated by nuclear power in the United States. And then down at the bottom, you've got France that's anywhere from, in this one, it's 75. It's up 75 to 78% of their electricity comes from nuclear. And then look at the top, China, India. The interesting thing is, as, as you also probably know there, China and India are, are two examples of countries that are, of course, growing astronomical rates. And they're actually very quickly going to, those bars are very going to quickly move to the right. They're actively building a lot of additional energy generation, and a part of that is nuclear. So, so it's a global, it's a, it's a global picture, but again, this is really going to change over the course of the next several decades. Uh, the United States uh, contribution of nuclear power to the United States generation will probably stay roughly constant, let's say, for the sake of this discussion, or some of these ones at the top are going to really quickly, rapidly uh, catch up. Oops, sorry. Uh, a little bit about, a little bit about the, the cost and the greenhouse gas aspects, as well as a little bit more about the current fleet. So when I said 20% electricity generation, that's about 104, that is not about, it is 104 reactors in the United States, uh, spread over multiple states in, in, in the United States. Um, it's important to note when you think about the climate change aspects of energy generation, um, nuclear actually is, now this isn't a life cycle look, this doesn't include the mining piece, uh, how much CO2 is generated from driving mine trucks around and all that sort of thing. So this is a little bit, I need to be careful here, but if you look at the energy, energy, uh, the energy system, things like nuclear, solar, wind, geothermal, and hydro are really, really not emitting a lot of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. So that's an important consideration. That's only one aspect of it. Now, nuclear, of course, has this thing that everybody worries about and we need to solve, and that's what do you do about the spent fuel and the nuclear waste, and I'll talk more about that. Because um, that's an important consideration. There is a challenge, and I think also an opportunity. Uh, what about cost? This is a little bit of a busy diagram, but the important point is that if you look at electricity production costs, coal's there in red along the bottom, nuclear's down there in green. You can see natural gas in blue sort of creeping down towards nuclear. If I updated this, natural gas is probably even perhaps crossing that curve or equal. So right now, the, the cost of nuclear is... It's very, very expensive to build plants. There's a lot of, it's a high cost upfront capital. But once they operate, they operate for decades. And so actually, once they're up and running, the utilities like them because they can operate them for very, very long periods of time and they make a lot of money off, the, off these machines. But when you, t right now in particular, when you talk about how do you replace, how do you expand generating capacity as demand increases, with natural gas, the way it's playing, particularly in the United States energy system, it's really, really causing some interesting behavior in, in the markets vis-a-vis -vis the utilities. Utilities are really looking at this and saying, new builds in nuclear just aren't economic right now in general terms with the price of natural gas. So natural gas is a game changer, I would argue. If this isn't about natural gas, this discussion, you could have a very active discussion about natural gas, but it is a game changer. And it, it, you'll see it definitely in the nuclear energy uh, picture, particularly as you think about whether there's new builds uh, going forward. 
but it is cost competitive. Um, but the question is, how are we going to meet our future energy demands? Uh, th th this is a little bit of future. Today we're at you know 15 terawatts worldwide. We're going to double by 2030, and and we're going to go up three times by 20 by the end of the century. Uh, you can't do all that by efficiency. You can't do all that by renewables. Uh, it's it, it is a, a, a mix, a portfolio of of energy technologies that have to be brought to bear. Uh, nuclear will, will play a role. And I've already talked about the global picture. Some countries will build a lot more nuclear than, say, the United States will, at least in the near, in the near term. But the United States will maintain a, a fairly robust fleet of reactors that are producing um, you know, a significant portion of electricity in the United States. So what about the current fleet? Um, again, these reactors capacity factor, which means of the amount of time that they can be operating and generating electricity, what percentage of time are they actually doing it? So a 90% is a very high capacity factor. So these things, once they're up and running, they run, they're effective, they're efficient. Um, the, co the cost decrease with time, uh, for two cents per kilowatt hour in production costs, very competitive. Uh, what's happening with a lot of the United States fleet is rather than building new, they're actually going into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and making arguments that they can actually drive the power up in existing units. That's the so-called up rates. So you can actually gain, in the United States, over, this number is about a year old, we've gained about the equivalent of about four new plants just by uprating existing plants. So there's that aspect of it. There's also active work going on with the utilities to actually look to renew, to extend their licenses. So the licenses are typically uh, 20 years, then extended for another 20. These things were typically envisioned to be 40-year life plants. There's an active program going on now to think about can they operate actually for 60 years, or even perhaps beyond 60 years. There is R&D challenges associated with that, the materials that, are, that make up the plant, et cetera. One has to be very concerned about making sure that those are up to being able to operate for those longer time periods. Um, but there's active discussions going on with the utilities, with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and R&D is being done to support that to actually extend the life of, of, more, not more, of more than one of the current fleet. So that's going on. So that's how you sort of maintain sort of that 20% or so uh, going forward. What about new? So this is a, this is a slightly older map uh, of the United States with, that identifies uh, different reactor technologies don't get lost in the alphabet soup at the bottom. It's just different reactor technologies. They're all light water reactors uh, using water as the moderator. Um, but this was, at least a couple years ago, the snapshot of where people were envisioning building new plants. I will tell you now, a lot of these currently, not, are, there's nothing really being built at most of these sites as we speak, and it's not clear that they'll be built anytime in the near future. There's, there's two sites, Vogel in Georgia, is as Southern companies actively building two units on their site, and Scana in South Carolina has licenses, looks like they're gonna go build. So of all of these units, we're talking about four units are all that being really contemplated to be built right now. And that ties in with, with the, the natural gas picture, the economics, a whole bunch of other considerations. So this was back in the days, if you follow this, this was the nuclear renaissance. This was what it was gonna look like. I would say we're not going through a nuclear renaissance. I think it's clearly there's been a lot of factors that have taken place, but we're clearly the system is taking a step back. Uh, what about Fukushima? We need to worry about that. That has that has implications for operating the, the existing fleet, the, the the utilities, the industry, uh, the labs, uh, the NRC are all thinking about it very deeply. Um, I will say that you know when you look at first Three Mile Island, then Chernobyl, and now Fukushima. The industry does show the ability to learn from these accidents. Um, so there's, we're in the midst of learning uh, from the Fukushima accident. It's still not fully understood exactly what happened, uh, but we're, with every day we gain more and more understanding. It's done some things that I think are very, very important. It shined a light, if you recall at Fukushima, there was a lot of spent fuel stored on site in those, in the, in those plants. Um, and even though those pools actually, in the end, turned out to not be compromised, it still really shined a light on the need to think very deeply about safety and security of this used nuclear fuel on sites, and also think about what are we going to do about this over the long term. And perhaps it started to accelerate the thinking, and I think that's, that's a good thing, because I'll get to that more. Um, it, all, it also shined a light on how these, how these, um, these stations react to station blackouts. So part of what happened there is you lost power at Fukushima. And once you lost power and then you lost battery backup, 
That's when things really went south uh, at that plant. And so it's allowed the United States and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and utilities here to really think very deeply about how do these plants respond in those kinds of scenarios, say flooding, uh, hurricane, earthquake, et cetera. So the NRC is in the process of, de of developing enhanced recommendations, regulations to respond to that. The utilities uh, will have to respond to that, and there will be dollars involved in that. Uh, but in general, the United States reaction was one of let's, th let's go through this methodically, thoughtfully, and, and, re and, and, and have the utilities do the right things. Uh, and I, and, and that's, that's playing out as we speak. Um, in terms of if, I already mentioned this, but if, if we do go to extending the lifetime of some of these plants, uprates, I already touched on this a bit, there is an R&D component to it, and also there's a, there's a Fukushima component to it. You could imagine fuels that you could develop that will, let's call them for this, this discussion, accident tolerant. Fuels that would actually respond much better in a, in a, in a, in a, in a partial meltdown like you get at, say, say a Fukushima example. Uh, that's on the R&D landscape. That's on our path right now as we work with industry to think about how to develop some of these advanced fuels. And also, and I'll, I'll touch on this, because one of the most vexing things for the United States in particular is how to deal with the used fuel. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on that because I think that's, um, that's a really important consideration to paint the current picture. So that's where I want to go next. So uh, Dr. Shreesheim touched on, so when you, when you take this uranium fuel and you stick it in a reactor and you drive these fission reactions, you produce, over the course of about three years, the fuel is no longer efficient, efficiently producing heat to generate electricity. So it's pulled out, and then it's so-called spent fuel, or in this case, you know, the industry likes to call it used fuel. It contains still a lot of uranium, it's got elements higher than, radium nuclides higher than uranium, plutonium, neptunium, things that you may have heard about. But because of the fission, you also generate a lot, if you think about the periodic table, you split uranium roughly in half, you generate a lot of stuff that's above uranium, that strontium, cesium, iodine, technetium, um, those sorts of elements. The, a lot of those are radioactive, half-lives from millions of years down, down to tens of years. So the stuff comes out of the reactor and it, 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 it's hot. And so it has to be stored, but then ultimately you have to dispose. So how's it managed? This is a picture of uh, Diablo Canyon in California. Just so, just so you know, that sits right on that sits on the Pacific. Those the plants in California, two of them sit uh, near near faults, and so they're spending a lot of effort in California, as an aside, thinking about the hazards associated with earthquakes, particularly post Fukushima, with the California plants. So there's two options to really manage the used fuel. You can either take it, the top so-called open fuel cycle, where you mine uranium, convert it, enrich it, put it in a reactor, generate electricity, you pull it out, you store it, and then you ultimately dispose of it in deep geology. That's a, that top one, currently the US policy. So the US policy is to go to direct disposal of used fuel. Bottom one, which Argonne has spent a lot of time thinking about, um, is the so-called closed fuel cycle. Where you take, instead of taking the fuel from the light water, from the reactors that are generating electricity and bury it in deep geology, you actually take it, reprocess it, separate components, make new fuel, recycle it in a reactor, perhaps a fast reactor, and you can actually generate additional electricity. There's still a waste component, so the most important point here, one of the most important points, is that you see geologic disposal no matter what. You have to have a repository no matter what you do. The waste stream that goes in a closed fuel cycle looks very different, and I will talk about that in detail. So the repository can look different, can be in a different site, et cetera, but that's an important consideration. So currently, back up a second. So, so you've heard of, Yuc who's heard of Yucca Mountain? Some people have. So because the policy of the United States was to go bury in deep geology, up until two years ago, the, the, the path was to develop a repository in deep geology in Nevada on the Nevada test site, about 100 miles north, uh, northwest of Las Vegas. Um, that was the path. It had gotten to a point where they had submitted a license application to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to go and construct the repository. The Obama administration and Obama won made a policy decision to withdraw that application. So I'll tell you that story here in a minute. But that led to basically no permanent disposition path in policy space for, for the spent fuel. So where does it sit? 
121 sites, 39 states. What is it? It is used fuel on commercial nuclear plant sites. It's also used research reactor fuel on DOE sites, like in Idaho, Savannah River, uh, Washington State Hanford that Dr. Shreesheim mentioned, and Savannah River in South Carolina. There's also high-level waste from the, the nuclear weapons production that went on over the past several decades. There is also nuclear waste generated from that. That's also being stored there. That was also destined for the Yucca Mountain Repository. So right now, we're, look, we're faced with no repository path. So what, what does that, what, what do we do as a country? So this is how it's stored. It's either in cooling pools at reactor sites, so the rods are sitting in pools, or in dry casks above ground, temporary storage, safe and secure for temporary storage, not a permanent solution. Uh, glass logs, in the case of high-level waste, they actually take the waste and so-called vitrify, put it in the glass, melt it into glass. Uh, or it's stored in tanks. Those tanks are places like Hanford. Those will have to be vitrified. So that's a current major, major multi-billion dollar project of the DOE to take all that liquid waste and vitrify it. So all these things have to be managed and, and disposed. So I talked about Yucca Mountain. That's a picture of Yucca Mountain, by the way. Las Vegas is off in the distance, sort of into the screen. Um, this is looking south, uh, looking south east towards Las Vegas. Uh, but because of the policy decision by the Obama administration to withdraw the application, uh, the president immediately had the Secretary of Energy form what's called a Blue Ribbon Commission, was called the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Energy Future. So a very esteemed group of folks who took a step back and said, okay, without Yucca Mountain as a path forward, what do we do? Uh, they recommended many things. Um, they did not recommend going back to Yucca Mountain. Uh, they recommended prompt action, restarting the repository program, looking for new sites, and also starting immediately to look for temporary storage sites so that we could start to consolidate the spent fuel rather than have it spread all, all over that map that I, that I pointed out. Also continue looking at closed fuel, fuel cycle technologies, those recycle technologies. Continue to do that work, but it's, it's much more of an R&D effort. Uh, don't implement. Continue on this path of disposing directly in geology. So they released that report, that's about a year ago. That's the picture of it up on the right. If you go, just, if you actually go into, just punch in BRC in your Google, it'll pop this up, actually. It's a popular find, so it's a pretty good read. It gives you a good history, and it also gives very, very succinct recommendations. The department, after about a year, actually two Fridays ago, two weeks ago today, responded. They were required to respond, Department of Energy. They released that report, that's there on the lower right. Go to the DOE website type in nuclear waste policy or nuclear waste or BRC response, it'll pop up. Um, they agreed broadly with the recommendations, but they made some important, consider, uh, important recommendations. They said, I should say that of those 104 sites that are spread across the United States, there's nine sites that the reactors are, are decommissioned. They're no longer producing electricity, but there's still fuel being stored there. So what they recommended was develop a, a small storage facility, consolidate the fuel from those nine sites, by 2021, which is actually probably aggressive. And then by 2025, build a larger, larger storage facility to start taking additional used fuel from commercial sites. And then have a repository by 2048. Very, very long time frames, but it's going to take, it takes that long to site, characterize, and ultimately develop a repository. Um, this, this is consistent with the Nuclear Waste Policy and the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Uh, but the, in the details, there's important things that are going to have to happen where Congress and the administration come together. These are tough times for the Congress and the administration to come together on things. Uh, so we'll see how long it takes. But Congress has to do something to help complement the administration's response. Senator Bingham, before he left Congress uh, in the 112th, uh, put, forward a, put forward a bill, a draft bill that was in response to the Blue Ribbon Commission. It was cons it's broadly consistent with the administration is saying. Uh, there's every reason for us to believe that uh, the Senate will come forward with something in this, in this Congress as well. So there will start to be a policy dialogue about getting this, getting this moving forward. This is a very, very important thing to solve for the current situation. Not to mention whether we build new plants. We've got 68,000 metric tons of this stuff already uh, piled up on sites. So no matter what happens in the future, we have to solve this problem. So what's next? Uh, and this is my last slide. Uh, so there's clearly got to be a discussion around nuclear energy. So I, I've already put forward to you that it's going to be roughly constant in terms of its percentage of electricity generation. Uh, 
how, how one uses nuclear in the context of the broad energy system for solving, for, for addressing energy security and climate change. Uh, no, no matter what you do, it has to be done safely and securely, and you have to manage the used fuel inventory. Uh, I talked about the response to the Bourbon Commission, probably amendments to the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, how we manage it, how we pay for it, all those things are going to need to be on the table. Uh, and then finally, we're continuing the R&D path. Uh, from Argonne's perspective, it's important from our perspective to continue to develop the advanced technologies as we solve these policy issues so that there's technology options as we go forward. That's really where, that we're, what our position is. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and let Bob come up and talk some more. My mousing talents leave something to be desired here. Ah. There it goes. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, first of all, um, I'd like to thank uh, C2ST for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, this is, I think, actually the third time I'm actually speaking uh, at one of these venues. It's a lot of fun. Um, I have um, sort of an interesting uh, connection to what we'll be talking about. Uh, quite aside from having been lab director at Argonne, um, I was also the fellow who actually ended up uh, closing all of the hot cells at Argonne. That was sort of the end of an era uh, at Argonne. And it had very much to do with um, uh, the way that nuclear energy has been approached by the Department of Energy, uh, basically reducing the footprint of the number of labs that are working actively uh, on the experimental side and recognizing the fact that in order to deal with uh, uh, R&D in the nuclear realm, the um, uh, today standards for um, safety and security are such that it's extremely, extremely expensive uh, to actually run uh, hot cells, you know, the, the place where you would actually manipulate um, uh, radioactive materials to the point where, fundamentally, uh, the, uh, the nuclear engineering part of DOE basically couldn't afford to have all the sites uh, operate. So um, Argonne has really changed where, where it fits into the picture. And uh, where it fits in the picture today is really looking to the future. Um, uh, part of what uh, Mark talked about has to do with looking to the future of what do you do about the used fuel. That's one area. Another one has to do with the reprocessing uh, of, uh, of nuclear fuel, the, the used fuel. And the third area has to do with uh, something I will talk about, which is looking to the future in terms of design. Uh, how, where do you go uh, with, um, with the future of nuclear energy? So that's what I'm going to talk about. So uh, it seems to me that uh, right from the outset, we have to be very clear about the fact that uh, uh, the future of nuclear energy in the United States and the future of nuclear energy abroad it's going to be radically different. Uh, and one fundamental reason is that the economic calculations elsewhere are radically different, and that elsewhere there are other considerations that come uh, to play that have nothing to do with economics that also don't play into the commercial sector in the United States. For example, the fact that some countries are, uh, that are currently not nuclear are interested in being nuclear fundamentally as a hedge uh, to basically develop the infrastructure, the technical the human infrastructure, the, uh, the uh, technology to be able to deal with things nuclear. Uh, and these are, uh, so this is a crucial issue that we'll be talking about a bit, which is the non-proliferation aspect of the spread of nuclear power. So what I'll talk about are two uh, issues. First of all, uh, the safety and security of operations, both from the point of view of what it actually is and how it's perceived, and then the economics. Um, so uh, when I talk about safety and security, I really mean three pieces uh, having to do with the operations of the plant, the management of the used fuel that comes out of the plant, and then finally the non-proliferation aspects. And each one of these uh, matters. And remember, I'll, I'm focusing on how these things play out here in the United States, and maybe during the question period, the discussion period, 
can talk about it uh, abroad. And the calculations are, are rather different. So what about uh, operations? So uh, the, the first point is that um, really serious incidents we know are extremely rare. So the, the three major incidents are the three uh, are it uh, since the start of nuclear power on the commercial sector, but they were obviously hugely impactful. So you're talking about events that are on the tail of the distribution from the point of view of occurrence, but also are in the tail of the distribution of how much damage they actually cause. And what's really interesting about this is that if you ask why do they happen, each one of them could be traced to very different uh, fundamental causes. So uh, each one of these incidents was not something that was like what happened before, first point. And the second is that in, in, both, in all three cases, there were flaws in the way that the reactors involved were designed and flaws in the way they were operated. So there's a combination of human problems and technical problems. And both of them really figure into thinking about how the future goes. So my own conclusion has been all along, I'm, I, I happen to be interested uh, professionally in the design of uh, new generation reactors, one of the things I'm I actually do. Uh, and it's pretty clear that if you look, certainly in the United States, that the future has to be uh, reactors of the kind that currently do not operate in the United States, the so-called Gen 3, or Gen 3 plus reactors that have passive safety features. So features that, go in, that are fundamentally based on, on physics, like for example, we think gravity is not going to be shut off, so take advantage of things like that, uh, not rely on not entirely on redundant safety systems. That's the first point. Uh, the second is that um, it's pretty clear that having a independent regulator, first independence, but then also has enforcement powers is unbelievably important. The United States from this perspective is actually uh, an exemplar of how to do this. The, the fact that uh, American plants have such high duty cycles that they operate more than 90% of the time is directly traceable to the fact that the NRC, our independent regulator, basically forced the industry to pay much more attention to how the plants are op actually operated. And if you look abroad, uh, uh, the NRC system is basically seen as an example of how to actually structure a nuclear industry in the, on the commercial sector. It's interesting that uh, in Japan, the regulator was not independent. In fact, uh, the, uh, the Japanese example, up until very recently, was it operated very much like we used to operate uh, before Three Mile Island, where basically the regulator was also the promoter of nuclear energy. Okay, so um, what about uh, waste management? You, so Mark talked a bit about this. Um, the waste is in fact highly dangerous. Um, some of it is dangerous because of the radioactivity. Some of it is dangerous because it's chemically dangerous, that plutonium, for example, is extremely po poisonous. And the stuff lasts for very long periods of time. And it is stunning that um, we actually do not have a nuclear waste strategy that is formal, that's agreed upon, and that's funded. What we have on the table right now is a proposal. Um, it's interesting that um, Mark mentioned that uh, the uh, BRC, the Blue Ribbon Commission, did not recommend uh, Yucca Mountain. There's a very important reason why it wasn't recommended, because they were told at the outset not to consider Yucca Mountain. So it was basically off the table in the discussion. So it wasn't that they thought it was a bad idea, so basically, we were told, don't think about it. And that was a political decision. It wasn't a technical decision. So here in the United States, the fundamental problem that we have is that we're faced with political issues that have stood in the way of how we deal with the nuclear waste, not technical issues. Uh, just north of our border in Canada, uh, they had very similar political problems. But today, in fact, the Canadians do have an agreed upon formal and funded uh, uh, waste strategy and they're building, in fact, deep storage facility in, Otto, in uh, Ontario. Uh, if you go to Sweden, um, Sweden has, again, a formal, agreed upon, and funded nuclear waste strategy. They know what they're doing. They're also doing deep uh, disposal. So uh, it is entirely possible, technically, to do it. Uh, but uh, here in the United States, we've been basically politically frozen, actually, implementing it. And it's too bad. 
And I should say that from my perspective, to really go ahead and have a full-fledged uh, building program, a nuclear renaissance in the United States, makes absolutely no sense in the absence of having a formal, agreed upon, and funded waste, uh, waste strategy. And finally, about proliferation. Now, usually, if you talk about proliferation, the United States is not regarded as a proliferator. We won't talk about the 1950s, where I think arguably we were, uh, through the Adams for Peace pro uh, program. That's, for example, how the Indians got a hold of nuclear technology. But um, certainly within the last 20, 30 years, I think we're not thought of as a proliferator. However, um, one of the things that the NRC recently did is it, uh, uh, it um, gave license approval to uh, General Electric uh, to pursue um, laser separation of uh, U-235 from U-238. Uh, laser separation has um, interesting um, property. Uh, first of all, it's much less energy intensive than any of the other separation technologies. Uh, certainly much less than gases diffusion by many orders of magnitude and significantly less than the use of centrifuges. What that means is that it's very difficult to detect. If you have a room the size of a space easily the size of this room, you could produce um, U-235s of fissile material from, um, uh, uh, from uh, commercially available uranium um, that is from a practical point of view, undetectable. And that is, in fact, a proliferation risk. Uh, technology is something that is knowledge, that is, uh, is you know, we are a sieve. Uh, it's a mistake to think that you can, you can really um, uh, segregate knowledge of this kind and prevent it from leaking out. It will, if we succeed, if GE succeeds, it will leak out. And so that, that is a concern. So those are the, the, uh, the uh, so if you like, on the technical and political end uh, of things that are preconditions for a nuclear future in the United States. But the fact of the matter is that in the end, if the economics don't make sense, uh, we're not going to do it. Um, and what I'm going to show you is um, uh, how the economics run. So uh, let's first look at uh, the gigawatt scale reactor. So those are the kinds of reactors that exist today. Uh, they're the ones in operation, the 104 reactors that Mark was talking about are of that, that scale. Um, before they're being operated, you have to ask, so how did that work? Because fundamentally what I'm going to tell you is that uh, uh, there is no renaissance here because it's too expensive. So what about those four? Well, those four reactors are built in states in which the, um, the equivalent of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the utility regulator um, is still using an old model for how the electricity market within a state is regulated. Remember that in the United States, the electricity market is regulated state by state. It's not a federal responsibility. The distribution of electricity, uh, the grid, is not a federal responsibility. Uh, it's done state by state. Um, in a state like Illinois, um, uh, there is a market for electricity. And if a utility wants to build a new plant, for example, Exxon wants to go out and build a nuclear plant, they have to go out to the commercial market and get the money. So they have to get a loan. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons for the expense, we'll talk about it in a moment, has to do with the risk capital uh, that, so the premium that the banks will charge uh, because when you uh, build a plant, um, you cannot guarantee uh, that, um, uh, that it's actually going to work, that the cost predictions projections are actually accurate. So banks regard lending money to uh, utilities that want to build nuclear plants as a highly risky venture. And there's uh, many examples of failures. Classic example, of course, is Lilco in New York on Long Island. They built a nuclear plant. And um, it turns out the regulator told them at the end the plant was ready for operations. And they were told, nope, you can't operate. So they spent a few billion dollars and got nothing for it. Um, so that uh, is a key element here of risk. In the states in which the plants are being built, South Carolina and Georgia, the regulator has a different attitude to it who pays. Uh, in those cases, in those two states, it's the old model where the utility can begin charging the rate base, that is you, the user, for the capital construction costs. In other words, even though the plants are not, don't exist yet, 
in the process of being built, the ratepayer already gets to pay the bill for the construction costs. And of course, that hugely reduces the risk uh, premium from the point of view of the banks, because basically what they know is that the ratepayer is going to be there as the backstop to pay for the construction. So for those, two, for those four plants, the economics works uh, very differently from what I'll describe in a moment, because there is a backup for the utilities uh, and the banks. Um, so the one exception to what, I, what, not, what I'm going to be describing are the uh, so-called small modular reactors, and I'll, um, I'll talk about, uh, about them for, for a bit. And uh, a few years ago, we looked into the economics of, uh, of these SMRs uh, for DOE. And uh, by the way, these things are all on the website uh, that you'll find at the University of Chicago. If you go to the epicuchicago.edu, you'll find these documents. Okay, so what about... Um, uh, the cost of building gigawatt scale plants. So one a metric for um, how much they cost is how much do you pay per uh, kilowatt. And what you're seeing up here are the numbers uh, starting from um, late 90s through uh, basically last year, or a year uh, about a year ago. And what you see is that the costs have gone to um, uh, somewhere around $5,000 per kilowatt. Now, whether or not something makes sense or not depends on, well, what, the, what is the competition? So what I've done there on the lower right is to show you what the competition is. One example Mark already mentioned is natural gas. Natural gas, if you, if you want to build a uh, combined cycle natural gas uh, plant, uh, it will cost you about $1,000 per kilowatt, a fifth. So you ask yourself, you know, would Exxon ever consider today building a nuclear plant of this sort? I don't think so. And I think John Rowe probably was here, said exactly the same thing. John said, no way. Um, even if you include carbon capture and storage, which basically doubles the cost for uh, one of these uh, gas plants, you're up to $2,000 per kilowatt, doesn't make sense. If you look at solar, uh, solar is actually quite expensive. But wind is not. So wind, for example, onshore wind, competes actually with natural gas uh, if you consider a carbon capture and storage. And both of them are less than half of the price of what you would do with nuclear. So I think the case is right here. It's pretty clear that uh, utilities that are not in states where the utility commission basically protects the utilities uh, from going bankrupt, basically has the rate payer uh, back them up, uh, in those so states like Illinois, California, most states, in fact, uh, nu there is really, at the present time, no future for gigawatt-scale nuclear plants. The other element that matters is not, it's not just the, um, uh, the uh, cost per kilowatt, but it also is just the total cost. Um, so there are some numbers here for uh, different kinds of technologies for example, if you buy, if you build a, a gas, uh, one of these plant, gas plants, for example, it costs something of the order of a billion dollars. Uh, if you uh, build a large nuclear facility, the ones, for example, in South Carolina and Georgia, they're of the order of 10 times larger. So what's the issue? Well, think of the market capitalization of the companies that would be building them. One thing that's unique about the United States compared to, say, Europe, is the small market capitalization of the utilities. Um, in Europe, the electricity providers, for example, uh, EDF, Electricité de France, is a huge company that is at least an order of magnitude larger than the largest of the American companies. The largest American company is Exelon, which has just, just merged with Constellation, and uh, its market capitalization is in the vicinity of about 30 to $35 billion. So would a company that has a capitalization that's about factor of three times larger than the uh, capital cost of a plant possibly take the risk of building such a plant? The answer is no. Don't do it. So there's a second issue. It's not just the question of how much uh, uh, you're paying per uh, energy generated, but also just the total amount of money that you're going to be spending. What it says is that in order to solve the, pro the economic problem, you have to solve two problems. The first problem you have to solve is you have to bring the price per kilowatt down to where you're actually competitive with gas. 
The second is you have to build something that these companies can actually afford. You, know, so you have to build something that's basically smaller. And that was fundamentally the motivation for looking at small modular reactors. So um, here's, the, here's the, uh, the, the, the bottom line. At the end, if you ask how can we be sure what will happen, there is a uh, wild card here. And the wild card is, of course, natural gas. Um, I think I'm, I, I'm probably fairly safe in predicting what the natural gas price will be, say, for the next couple of years. It's probably going to be somewhere below uh, $5 per million BTU. That's sort of a standard benchmark. Uh, in Asia, the price of natural gas is about $15 to $18 per million BTU. The uh, Henry Hub price in the United States for natural gas, so the one that will appear, for example, in your gas bill from Peoples, is somewhere around 350 to 360 uh, per million BTU. So there's a huge, huge price disparity between what we pay for natural gas in the United States and what it is internationally. Now, on a time scale of, say, 20, 30 years, which is, by the way, the time scale on which you can really expect to see a really major change in the nuclear industry in the United States, on that time scale, how sure are we about the natural gas price in, say, 2025? 2030? The answer is, well, maybe we're not so sure. Uh, what are the risks? The risks are, first of all, that we're going to be exporting a lot of natural gas. Uh, there are uh, liquefaction facilities that are now build, being built on the Gulf Coast to basically export natural gas, mostly to Asia. Uh, natural gas is increasing the feedstock for the chemical industry. Uh, natural gas is likely to be impactful in the transportation industry. So, there, so what's happening is the usual, which is if there's a surplus of on the supply side, what's going to happen is that on the demand side, demand is going to increase. So what the end result will be in 20, say 20 years, is anybody's guess. So what that suggests is that folks that need to be able to plan will tend to hedge. So one of the arguments for nuclear power of the small modular reactor kind that I'll talk about has to do with this hedging strategy that utility does have to be able to protect itself on the outside because energy in the energy market, anything you do has a long time constant. It takes a long time to plan, to actually implement, to get, uh, get to the regulatory apparatus to actually build. So you can't just turn around and say, oh, the gas price has gone, gone up. I'm going to build a nuclear plant tomorrow. That's not going to happen. So um, there are certain uh, um, uh, unavoidable complexities. Here are some examples. Um, you can see, for example, what happens to the natural gas price over the last uh, uh, 15 years or so. Uh, so you know, if you think it's predictable, it's about as predictable as the, uh, as the stock market, or maybe worse. Um, and I'll tell you, when the peak is up to you know, $14, $15 per million BTU, uh, that causes us headache because we use it for heat, and it certainly will cause headaches for the nuclear, uh, for the electricity industry, because natural gas, until very recently, was being used for peaking. There was there, there were gas plants that were only turned on uh, when there was in increased demand. So most of the time, these gas plants are just sitting, not doing anything. So from the point of view of a, uh, of a company that expended money to build these things, and paying prices like that, that is, you know, it's time for panic. So uh, what about um, uh, this issue of uh, SMRs? So what I'm first going to talk about is the construction cost, and then I'll talk about uh, the operations. So the construction cost, uh, there are three pieces that you have to worry about. First of all, if you go out and try to build one today, uh, it is, will be enormously expensive. The first one is going to be, uh, in terms of cost, totally, totally unaffordable for a utility. And basically what you're going to count on is that if you have an order book that's large enough that the vendor who's going to be building these things basically establishes a factory. Remember, SMRs, the idea of SMRs, the reason that you're going to be building them more cheaply than the gigawatt scale plant per kilowatt is because you're going to be uh, building them on an, what's effectively an assembly line. It's basically like building airplanes, uh, the way uh, Boeing builds airplanes. You have a crew 
that knows what it's doing. It's always the same crew, and they go from reactor vessel to reactor vessel building this. Uh, gigawatt scale plants have been uh, basically faced with the fact that the, the, the build rate is so small that um, the same group of people uh, building one plant is not the same as building the next plant. Uh, think about the fact that we have not built a nuclear plant in this country in 25 years, something like that. Okay? So we don't have the trained workforce. Uh, the one that's, uh, that's in uh, South Carolina right now, uh, it's an excellent question how long you can keep all those people around to build the ones in Georgia. It's a good question. Depends on how long it will take to go through the, license, the full licensing procedure and for the utility there to actually get the money to start. So SMRs are predicated on the ability to have a single workforce building these things on basically on a mass production. Mass production is, is perhaps a bad word, but basically it's the same crew of people building things. So you basically do really take advantage of a learning curve. This means that you have to have an order book. You need to be sure that there are enough people out there ordering them. Um, and the question is, where does the order book come from? Certainly, the American utilities will not be in the position to actually construct the order book, because uh, what they would be paying for is the learning curve. They're not going to be willing to do that. They're in business to make money. So what that means is the order book has to be constructed by other folks. For example, uh, it could be the national labs. It could be DOD bases. It could be uh, uh, um, folks uh, uh, in the international market that see a need for uh, smaller reactors, so the, in the, so the size range of a few hundred megawatts that would um, fit into national grids that don't have the capacity to deal with gigawatt scale reactors. There are many countries where you can't simply put a gigawatt scale reactor in because the grid is simply technically not uh, up to snuff. So this means that the federal government is inevitably involved and that means you're back at the political uh, issue of whether or not the federal government is prepared to actually uh, provide the order book. Um, we don't know what the risk premium is. So that's something that's going to be explored. Uh, we don't know what the market will think about building these. And this will depend hugely on whether or not the order book is actually in place. Will the bank see that this is actually a going business? Um, this, this is an example of where, uh, where we saw the uh, the, the price per kilowatt, you notice that um, uh, the, when you start out, when you build the very first plant, you're in never never land from the point of view of uh, commercial viability. And um, uh, we think that in terms of uh, cost per kilowatt, somewhere in the 2020s, you can probably push it down uh, uh, to somewhere around $4,000 uh, uh, per kilowatt. So remember, that's not competitive with today's gas. Oops. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so assuming, assuming that um, the cost targets, this learning curve, can actually be done, um, it turns out that uh, if you think that natural gas will go up to prices of the order of um, somewhere around, um, uh, you know, where it used to be historically, which is more of the order close to $10 per million BTU, then uh, these plants actually become competitive. A big difference between uh, natural gas-fired plants, or actually any other plant other th uh, uh, that depends on fossil fuel and nuclear, is that the fuel cost for a nuclear plant is insignificant part of the equation, whereas the fuel costs dominate, actually, uh, for fossil, f uh, fossil plants. So, uh, the cost of electricity production in gas-fired plants is hugely sensitive to what the natural gas price is, whereas for nuclear plants, it's very insensitive to what the uranium price is. Basi basically, the price of electricity for a nuclear plant is fundamentally uh, uh, governed by how much it costs to build the plant. So where does it leave us? Well, um, uh, Mark already mentioned that DOE has actually um, uh, sent a draft proposal uh, to, um, to Congress, so the, this administration now has a, uh, a, a draft policy for what to do. Um, and it, uh, as Mark said, it largely followed the BRC recommendations. There are some differences. Um, the Department of Energy also chose a company, uh, Empower, uh, to be the first vendor who would actually explore design construction of an SMR 
And that picture that you see on the right-hand side is, in fact, the Empower design. It's close to 200 megawatts electric. Um, it's a pressurized water reactor. It, uh, it's, um, uh, it builds on the heritage of uh, the uh, participants, principally a B&W, Babcock, and Wil Wilcox, which is in the business of building what are effectively modular reactors, namely the, uh, the reactors that sit on submarines and uh, nuclear surface ships. So they certainly have a history of building th uh, these kinds of things at that scale. Um, uh, all of the issues that bedevil uh, gigawatt scale plants, where were you going to get the pressure vessel from, all these kinds of things don't exist for these kinds of plants. And they have a partner TVA that is interested, of course, in these kinds of reactors and a civil construction firm, Bechtel, that's interested in actually putting these together. So where we are is um, it's slow. If you think that this is going to happen on a short time scale, um, you're deeply mistaken. We're talking about something that uh, if, if they succeed, is only going to see some traction in the 2020s and beyond. And it all is preconditioned for, on the United States actually having a sensible waste management plan which we do not have today. We do not have that implemented. Um, just to give you a feeling for uh, what's going on elsewhere, Mark already mentioned China and India. China um, put a stop to construction after Fukushima. They did a, a, a study uh, of uh, how, how, how to think about their future. Um, they've just resumed. Uh, they've decided not to build any more Gen two plants. Gen two plants are the kind that we have today in the United States. Uh, the only plants that they're going to build are new design, Gen three and beyond plants. And they're, they're close to 30 plants are in construction right now. So I think what Mark said is quite right. We're going to see a real change. So with that, with the discussion. Well, thank you for our, uh, to all of our speakers and um, anyone, I would just go right on into Q&A. Um, I think we have some limited time here, but anyone would like to answer, ask a question to uh, Dr. Shreesham, Dr. Peters, or Dr. Rosner at this time? Yes. Mm -hmm. I could start. Um, short answer is probably no. Uh, the, the, there's, there is uh, starting to be an expansion of the number of nuclear engineering programs at, at universities are starting to ramp back up. So that, there's that part, but there's also other aspects of the workforce. Who, who's going to actually make the reactor vessels? And so it's the range of expertise that isn't, that isn't there. So we have to think about it holistically. So I would argue, no, part of the SMR argument is you leverage a workforce that's already doing a lot of these smaller reactors for, say, the Navy and others. And so they, you build off a, a foundation, Bob should speak to this, uh, and then you can build off of that. But in terms of building big plants, uh, the workforce is a challenge, for sure. Yeah, I, I think one argument, an additional argument for SMRs is precisely that uh, the workforce to build gigawatt scale plants, uh, at, you know, at a rate that we're, that people were dreaming about, simply doesn't exist. And we're not just talking about engineers. Uh, you're talking about people that know, for example, how to weld a stainless steel, which is not trivial. And uh, that workforce also doesn't exist. So there's a uh, in order to really do uh, so. So a renaissance based on gigawatt scale plants, I view as extremely unlikely. SMRs are different because um, companies like B&W have been in this business for the past 40 years. And so they have a workforce that's capable of doing this, and they're certainly able to train additional people. I mean, I think the capacity is there. So I think for the SMR industry, uh, that the, the, the worries that you, one has for gigawatt scale plants isn't there. Someone else in the audience have a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
If you could just repeat okay, so, the question. Yeah, so, so, everyone... so the, uh, the, question, if the first question has to do with the fact that um, uh, nuclear plants all need uh, a source of cooling, and there's one example uh, where uh, the source of cooling uh, uh, almost disappeared. And so what do you do then? So um, it is absolutely the case that um, a smart strategy for utility to locate nuclear plants is a place where uh, you minimize worries about the, co uh, the cooling water. It's the reason, actually, that the Chinese, as part of the, their new strategy, have decided to no longer build nuclear plants deep in the interior of China, that they're, uh, they're going to concentrate on building plants actually uh, near the seacoast for exactly this reason. Um, so that, that, that's uh, point number one. The second point that you asked about uh, had to do with proliferation. Um, well, that is an issue. Um, uh, one proliferation worry is that uh, SMRs have this uh, feature that whereas gigawatt scale plants are, um, there's a constraint in their distribution because not many countries are capable of, of absorbing these, uh, these kinds of plants. Uh, this is not so true for the smaller plants, um, especially uh, plants that, uh, that uh, some companies have proposed that, are, uh, uh, that have capacities of the order of 50 uh, megawatts electric. So these are things that could power a small town, for example. Um, how do you design them? So uh, how do you design them so they're proof against, for example, somebody going in and taking out the stuff? That is, th that is a, an issue, um, and um, I think the, uh, the industry is now in discussion actually with uh, the NRC. There is a, it's a quite controversial point, which is how much security do you have to have in place in order to protect an SMR as opposed to a gigawatt scale plant? And uh, the companies like Empower are arguing that because there is less risk involved, I didn't mention that the that design that I just showed in the picture is underground, it's below grade. So the idea of being able to get in and uh, grab stuff out is much, much harder uh, than in existing plants. So, um, so they argue you need uh, less protection, other people argue just the opposite, and so this is something that remains to be resolved. So real, qu real quick, uh, on let's use Sandy as an example. Those plants shut down before Sandy hit, orderly, in accordance with the way they were, their operating license. So, so it's not a bad thing that they shut down, because they shut down orderly before the hurricane hit, so that's important. And that's part of the terms of the license, the low water level Bob already touched on. But I also, just to reemphasize, the notion of proliferation uh, risk and security is an important part of these advanced designs that we're do not just in SMRs, but a lot of the advanced work that we're doing, security is one of the important criteria that we're thinking about, and that's, that includes proliferation risk. So you're always trying to develop technologies that are safer and more secure. Oh, boy. Um, right there in the front. Well, actually, actually, okay, the question was the relationship between the U.S. and Canada and how we're perhaps cooperating with, with Canada, collaborating and cooperating with Canada. Um, in waste management in particular, uh, I'll speak to that first. I'll start there. So, so Bob, Bob touched on the fact that Canada has re, restarted their nuclear waste management program, and they're going through a very structured, let's call it, it's, it's called adaptive management process, where you actually... Go, and it's what's going on in Scandinavia as well, where you actually go through a process that's consent-based, meaning you actually get work with communities to volunteer to site nuclear facilities. And so Canada is following that process. Incidentally, one of our experts in the U.S., who Bob and I both know quite well, helped them. So there is cooperation at the individual level, uh, helped them devise it. But there's active cooperation between DOE and their equivalent in Canada. To, and so I'm actually hopeful that because they've just started it, as we embark on this consent-based process, which, which was one of the recommendations, I'm hopeful we can leverage leverage that. Gentleman, the beard over here. Thank you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry, wrong side of the room. Over there. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I, 
it's it's um it's viable it, it, it's viable it's it's um i mean there's there's reasons the uranium fuel cycle has been the fuel cycle of choice historically in the u s and worldwide uh, there is development of thorium there's reactors there's been development of thor thorium fueled reactors from the from really the advent so there's nothing that precludes it uh, those who are proponents for thorium will argue it's it's more it has a lower proliferation risk uh, we could have a lengthy discussion about ab about that there, there's still potential uh, but it doesn't produce the some of the bad actors in the that the uranium fuel cycle does that's 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 certainly not arguable um, but it, in general, it seems to be being explored primarily as more, more of a, I'll call it a niche area. However, there are countries that are looking at it more deeply, and it's an energy security thing. India, for example, they have a lot of thorium and not a lot of uranium. So from an, their energy independence or energy security perspective, they're developing it much more aggressively. So it's, it's out there. There's some movement in the U.S., but most of the R&D effort and anything that the utilities are thinking about is all uranium, uh, based uranium. Based. Now so you, so uh, oh. just to follow up. Um, uh, because the the non-proliferation aspects have been uh, touted, uh, so um, a group at Los Alamos um, a few years ago uh, was basically took it as a challenge problem: could you build a weapon uh, based on materials that come from a thorium-based reactor? And the answer is yes. Now you, sir. Thank you. Did you all hear that? The question was, how did they know in the case of Hurricane Sandy so far in advance? I mean, the, the, the hurricane forecasts, they knew, they knew the path within the swath of probability for, say, a week out. So they were able to plan appropriately to shut down. Oh, but it's designed to sustain the hurricane. They just shut it down for just to be absolutely sure that it was mm -hmm. in shutdown mode. But the, it's designed for f the maximum floods, the maximum winds, and all of that. So that's all, again, all part of the licensing process. Mm -hmm. No. You right here, sir? Oh, so, excuse me, sir. Hold on, hold on one sec, sorry. So, so what you're getting at is that the MPT, which is the governing uh, uh, international treaty, uh, has some very serious flaws, and I think they're widely acknowledged. The principal flaw is that uh, there is no consequence to a country uh, if it decides to withdraw from the non-proliferation treaty. Um, so, so what we're talking about is uh, uh, modifications of the MPT. And you probably know that uh, this is something that gets regularly discussed and um, is a difficult subject. And it's particularly difficult for the United States because uh, I have been actually in a room um, at the IEA with, uh, where, with um, 30 other uh, folks, uh, 30 other countries, where um, uh, the opposition to um, having the United States suggestions followed or strengthening the MPT were basically countered by the argument that the United States actually violated the MPT. And I think, you, I, I don't know how, much, how many of you in the audience know that um, during the Bush administration, uh, the United States signed a treaty with India that uh, gave uh, a nuclear, American nuclear technology to India. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the requirement was that the civilian uh, reactors 
be inspected. But of course, they have lots of reactors that are not civilian. Um, the MPT says that a country can only get access to nuclear technology from the haves if they are members in good standing of the treaty. And as you pointed out, India is not a member of the treaty. They never signed the treaty. So I think a good case can be made that we violated the MPT. So we are, the problem that we have is that, uh, you know, all the good arguments that we might have, and we think that we're good guys, uh, there are people in the rest of the world who don't think that. We don't agree with that. So, 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 uh, so Mark is going to say something on the technical side, but, but on the political side and practical side, let me just say, the cat's out of the bag. Uh, the South Koreans already have the technology, the Russians have the technology, the Chinese have the technology, so we are no longer in control of that. The one area where we still have control is on the laser separation technology. And this is why I said we would be foolish in the extreme to really push that, but, you know, there we are. I, I, David, I, I want to make one, I guess, a technical point. Uh, that there was a lot of political and policy pieces there. It, there, it, I, there is no technology that you can use for reprocessing, reprocessing that's proliferation proof. So don't take my statement as saying it's proliferation proof. But if you look at pyro versus water based reprocessing, there is a difference. Uh, I would also go back to the, the cat is out of the bag. So what we're doing, I can't speak to what happened 20, 30 years ago. But uh, developing, pot, continue developing pyroprocessing in cooperation with, say, the South Koreans. The U.S. and the South Koreans are working actively. An important part of that collaboration on the U.S. side is driving them to continue to improve the technology to address as best as possible, the making it more and more lower and lower proliferation risk. But you can't get around policy frameworks and safeguards and agreements to be part of the NPT. That's got to be a part of it. And if countries can't, then you have to pursue policy political options. I, there's, that's really reality. We have time for one more question. Uh, gentleman right there back. Yeah, DePaul Sweatshirt. <laughs> So, so I think both of us probably have some comments about that. So um, uh, if you look abroad, um, uh, countries like, let's, let's take China, for example, okay? So China um, has a huge energy needs growing, and they're principally meeting them right now by building coal-fired plants. They're also building nuclear plants, but at a much slower pace. That is, the n n number of gigawatts per year that are being produced additionally I I through nuclear is much smaller right now than they are through coal. Um, however, if you look at their long-range plan, their long-range plan is to be essentially nuclear by the end of the century. So the, the coal plants that they're building are finite lifetime plants that are basically getting through this hump of need that they have right now. In the long term, they're looking for a nuclear future. So it's interesting that it's the country that today is by far the biggest contributor of CO2 to the atmosphere. Their plan, and these are folks that implement their plans, is to be nuclear uh, by the end of the century. Yeah, I mean, it, that's a, it's a great question, and it's really, really hard to answer because it's so complex. Uh, you know, because you can't look at climate without looking at economics and a whole bunch of other things. Then how do you, how, is it a carbon tax, is it a cap and trade, da, 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 all, the, all those sorts of things. But it's inescapable that nuclear is large baseload and it doesn't produce CO2. So, so it would have a, a play in, uh, in, around the table in conversation, but there's the economics arguments in natural gas. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're capping and trading, can you use natural gas with carbon capture and storage? There's, it would be, but it would be certainly part of the conversation. It has to be, particularly if you start to try to limit CO2 emissions. Yes, thank you so much for attending. I'm sorry, we've, we've got people waiting for the room, I'm afraid. 
I would love to actually continue the conversation outside the door. Um, the members of Argonne will still be here for a while, but we have to leave the room. There's a class coming in. So um, thank you for everybody coming. And thank you to our speakers, Dr. Rosner, Dr. Shreesheim, and Dr. Peters. That was great. Thanks for the chance.